Amen. Would you, uh, would you pray with me this morning as we come to consider this portion of God's Word? Lord, indeed, it is our desire that you would speak through your word to each one of us, Lord. You have spoken, and that word continues on by your great power, by your glory. It is the word of the eternal God, and therefore it speaks forever. But Lord, we do not always have a tenderness to hear and to receive those words. Lord, our ears are not always open the way they should be. Our eyes do not see the way that they should. And so we pray this morning you would direct our focus to the lamb that was slain, that we would behold and hear his words this morning, that we would abide in his word, that we might live. Father, you are worthy of all glory and honor and praise and majesty. All dominion belongs to you. You reign in heaven. You accomplish all your holy will. You do whatever you'd want to do in heaven above and on earth beneath. You reign above the waters, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea. Even then, you have a river that makes glad the people of God, and you satisfy them with your goodness, Lord. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you do in our lives. And I pray this morning, Lord Jesus, that you would shepherd our souls as only you know how. Lord, there is sin that needs to be dealt with among us. There is hardness of heart that needs to be addressed, or there's There are distracted minds, there are divided hearts, there are those whose gaze has slipped over to the things of the world, or there are trials that we are going through, there are hardships and heartaches that we struggle to deal with, Lord, and we need you to minister to us where we are. Show us your faithfulness, Lord. Remind us of your goodness. Administer to us the grace of the gospel this morning and help us rejoice in you. Father, before we come to your word, I do, I do want to lift up baby Gilman to you as a body. Lord, you know what's going on and you know why. And and Lord, we trust in you. We trust you with this little baby. No matter what you do, no matter what happens, Lord, you are good and you do good. You are good to all, and your mercies are over all your works. And there is not a single baby that has been knit together in his or her mother's womb that you have not been intimately and intricately involved with. In the midst of the world of pain, your great name, Lord God, is a subject for praise in every place. It is a song on earth, it is an anthem in heaven. Its glory and its virtue knows no end. So help us rejoice in your great name revealed in Jesus Christ. Lord, we trust in you. We look to you. Now we ask that you would apply your word to us as we need it applied. In Jesus' name, amen. Hold on just a second. There we go.
All right. Would ask that you could please continue to lift up the Gilman family and their baby boy. And uh, I didn't. I, I forgot that we were singing that uh, that first song, uh, James. The title just slipped right out of my mind. The first song we sang, "Only a Holy God." Yeah, that's one of my favorite songs to sing when Brian is here. Because I just, I can remember seeing Brian in the chorus. Uh, Come and behold him. He's <laughs> just singing it out, unashamed, beckoning his brothers and sisters to join him in praising the Lord with such fervor and zeal. I, I just, I love that. And I, I hate that he is not here this morning to sing that with us. But we need to keep him in our prayers as well. All right, as we come to uh, John chapter 8, verses 43 to 47, we have some difficult, some more difficult matters to discuss. You know, many people point new believers to the gospel of John because they think it's the simplest gospel to read and understand. And in a sense, that's true, right? As, as has been said, an infant can wade in its waters safely, right? But as you actually walk through the Gospel of John, you find that its waters are actually deep enough that an elephant truly can drown in, in its depths. And uh, I, know, I know that we like things to be simple. We like them to be very straightforward. We want John to be just simple Gospel of John. But today we, we actually come to some, some very difficult truths to walk through. And... Um, I hope you've felt the compounding nature of the difficult things that Jesus has been saying to these Jews in John chapter 8 and John chapter 7. I mean, to, to say to them, you are not the children of Abraham. You are not the children of God. You are the children of the devil. Those are hard things. And Jesus continues to say some very difficult things that we'll have to see here this morning. Now, when I was new in the faith and in that honeymoon period of, of my walk with the Lord right after he saved me. So what's today's date? So on September 14th, it'll be 21 years since the Lord saved me. And I remember in those early days, it, it didn't take long for me to start wondering why other people weren't believing in Jesus the way I had come to believe in Jesus. You know, by God's grace, I had come to experience um, a deep fellowship with Christ through the Holy Spirit and, and in the Word of God. Uh, it, was, it was hard for me to imagine that anyone could hear the truths that I had heard and that I had come to believe in and not be affected by those truths the same way I was, right? And, and really, it was my conviction at that time in those early days that the reason why people aren't believing in Jesus the way that I believe in Jesus is because people just aren't faithfully preaching him. And so we need faithful preachers again so that people can feel the effects of the word of God being heralded the way it ought to. That's a pretty arrogant posture, right? Though it was sincere, it was, had some arrogance in it. Well, I had tasted such liberating power through the truth of the gospel. I had experienced such hope, such peace, such deliverance from my sins, such freedom from the enslavement of the things of the world. That was one of the most amazing things to me, was not necessarily as much that the sin had fallen off from me, those overt sins that I was engaged in. What was amazing to me was that the allurement of the world had dissipated. I, I didn't want to watch TV anymore. I just wanted to sit outside reading the scriptures. <laughs> like I just wanted to be with the Lord. That was the most amazing part to me. But I, anyway, I had, I had experienced such freedom from the enslavement of the things to sin. There was, there was real power. There, there was a real presence of Christ in my life that I knew for the first time in a very real way. And I, I just knew that as, as soon as I could tell others the things that I had now come to know and believe, they would experience Christ like that too, right? And so what I did, I started walking the streets in my neighborhood, going door to door. I, I wrote a seven-page single-space track to hand out to people, which no one read. <laughs> but it was titled, Too Long to Be Wrong. I stole that title from a sermon that the pastor at the time had preached. 
I, I even wrote a letter to uh, the football players on my team, just calling them to faith in Christ and uh, to repent of their sin and fall at the feet of the Savior. I, I thought that if I could just tell people the truth, then they will understand too and they will believe. But to my surprise, rather than finding people ready and willing and eager to come to Christ, the more I declared the beauty of Christ to them, the more they not only rejected that but, or, or him, the more they rejected me, right? I remember one 80-year-old lady telling, swearing to me that she had never sinned a day in her life and she had no need of my Savior. Kicking me off of her front porch. Uh, football team, my friends, I mean, they, I became a laughing stock. They made fun of me. I pretty much lost all my friends. And I struggled to understand why, why is it that the same truth that had so powerfully gripped me and had so truly changed who I was seemed to have absolutely no impact upon those with whom I was sharing it? Right? I, had, I began to wonder, had, had I been deceived, right? Had, had I been deceived by something? Did I, did I get caught up in something that maybe just everyone else can't see and I'm, I'm now trapped in this thing? Or, or maybe I just wasn't sharing the truth of the gospel the right way. And that's why people weren't seeing the glory of Christ the way I did. Why was it that they did not hear the word the way that I heard it? Well, here in John 8, 43 to 51 we find Jesus experiencing that same thing. But he didn't have the same question. He knew the answers anyway. There are two ways that we find Jesus dealing with this issue of sinners not believing in his word, and I hope that we're going to see one of them this morning. We're going to come back to the second one next week. But the two things I want to look at in this passage are, first of all, Jesus' answer for their unbelief. What was Jesus' answer for why they weren't believing in him? And then secondly, next week, we're going to look at how Jesus responds to that unbelief. Okay? So today we're just looking at Jesus' answer for their unbelief. And there are two reasons that Jesus gives in this passage for why these Jews were not believing in him. And I want to look at those together. The first one we find in verse 43, which is they were not believing in him because they were not able to hear the truth. They were not able to hear the truth. There should be a slide right after that one. There we go. That's that sub point. They were not able to hear the truth. Verse 43, Jesus says, the reason these Jews did not understand what he said was because they did not have the ability to hear it. He says, why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. Now, we've seen that word cannot in relation to some pretty important concepts already in the Gospel of John, haven't we? You might remember some of them, like John 6, when Jesus says to the crowd, none of you can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Or John 6, 65, no one can come to me unless the Father grants that he comes. See, God is the sovereign one here, right? God is the one who is in control of who can and cannot come to Christ. If we were left to ourselves, Jesus says, you would have no ability in yourself to come to Jesus. You'd have no ability in yourself to come to him. The Father must bring you. The Father must call you forth. Well, we find that same language here in John 8, 43. The, the Jews did not understand what Jesus was saying because they did not have an ability to hear what he was saying. Now, the hear there, to, to understand, whenever he says, you don't understand what I'm saying, that's talking about knowing what he's saying, that they haven't, they haven't been able to grasp the weight and the significance of what he's saying, right? It's, Jesus is obviously not talking about their physical ability to hear, Right? They, they hear what he's saying in, in, in its words, in the physical words, because they keep arguing with him. They keep coming back with, with counterpoints to what he is saying to them. You're not children of Abraham? No, we are. Abraham is our father. You, God is our father. Well, if God were your father, you'd believe in me. You'd love me. They keep countering what he's saying. They hear the physical words he's saying. What they don't have are spiritual ears to hear the truth savingly. 
right? Those ears of Matthew 13, 9 that Jesus says, you know, if you have ears to hear, then, then the one who has ears to hear, let him hear, right? Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 29 Uh, Let him who has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Not everyone has that ear to hear. Not everyone can hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. But Jesus says, if you do have an ear, then pay attention. Hear what the Spirit is saying. These are the kinds of ears, this is the kind of hearing that these Jews did not have. They did not possess it. And that's why Jesus says they were not able to understand his teaching. Now, verse 44, this inability to hear is amplified by their connection with the devil. You see this in verse 44, Jesus says, they could not hear his word, they were of their father, the devil. And as some of you know, by bitter experience, the devil's work, or excuse me, the devil works hard in the lives of those who are his to make sure that they don't go anywhere. Matthew 13, verse 19, Jesus says, it is the evil one. It is the devil who comes and snatches away the truth of God's gospel from the hearts of some people. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 4, as Paul is contemplating why it is that some people do not believe in the gospel that he's preaching. We see here that he understands the devil to be actively involved. He says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world, the devil, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So for Paul, as Paul goes out preaching the gospel and he finds that there are some who do not hear it, they will not receive it and they will not respond to it in genuine faith, What is Paul's understanding about what's happening under the surface there? These sinners are blind. And who is the one who is laboring to keep them blind so that they can't see the glory of Christ? The devil. The God of this world. See, in John chapter 8, these Jews were the children of the devil, as Jesus says, and the devil was not willing to let them go. Now, this doesn't mean that these Jews were innocent victims of the devil's schemes, right? Because in verse 44, Jesus says that they were of their father, the devil, and they wanted to do the desires of their father, right? They are are children of the devil. They're under his authority. They're under his sway. He's the God of this world who is blinding their minds. But these Jews love to have it like that. See, they desire, they they will is the word here. Their will is to do the desires of the devil, the lust, the pleasures of the devil, the things that the devil desires to happen in contradiction to the will and the plan and purpose of God. All of those things were what the people, these Jewish people wanted. See, they were not helpless victims of the devil's work. They were willful accomplices. They were associates of the devil. They were children who delighted in doing the will of their father. And so we see this unholy union between these sinners in John 8 and the work of the devil. The work is, the devil is hard at work, blinding them to the truth. And they wanted to remain blind to the truth. So it was symmetry there. We want to to be blind to the truth. You want to blind us to the truth. Hey, this is a good partnership. This is why Jesus says in John 8, 45, though he speaks the truth to the Jews, they did not believe him, even though, John 6, 46, they had no, they had nothing that they could bring against Jesus to prove that he was in the wrong. They had no basis for their opposition, and yet they still desired to oppose him. That means that they were not under the influence of the truth. They were not under the influence of God. They were under the influence and sway of the enemy who is a liar and the father of lies. Now, you know, beloved, this is the same situation that you and I face when we deal with sinners in our own day. Did you know that? I hope you know that. I hope as you go out and you seek to preach the gospel, as every single one of you are called to do. Do you know that? 
Didn't know that either, did you? You should have known that. I don't think you know that. All of us are called to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And if you have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light, then you have something to proclaim. You have the glory of Christ to proclaim. And as we go out there preaching that gospel, we need to be prepared for the fact that we are going to face opposition. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when and how, right? Just as Jesus Christ was sent by the Father to preach the gospel to the world, so you and I have been commissioned by Jesus to continue proclaiming the message he entrusted to us. All of us are employed for that purpose. And as we do that, we will find the same reality that Jesus is speaking of here. We will find that sinners are not only unable to understand the truth of the gospel we're preaching, but we're also going to find that they don't want to hear the truth of the gospel that we are preaching. Right? It's, it's, it's all being mocked. Why do you think the opening ceremony of the Olympics was what it, is, what it was? And how many of you kept watching the Olympics because, well, we want to support the athletes? And I just put a parenthesis here. <laughs> we are weak Christians. Some of us can't stop shopping at Target despite their ambitions and their policy. Sure, all companies are ungodly, but not all of them come out and force it down your throat like that. This mockery, this, this, this uh, slap in the face of our Savior and our Lord as, as the opening ceremony of all the games that are going to follow, that sets the tone for everything else. And yet we think we can just, ah, well, yeah, that's the world. They're going to be like the world. But I can still enjoy these things over here and not be associated with that. You can't do that, guys. The world won't let you do that. In our world and in our day, that's a compromise. Maybe you disagree with me, but you're wrong. <laughs> See, so we have no backbone we have no strength. So we, we, we like our comfort. We like our pleasures. We don't want to rock the boat. We love our jobs, our homes, our cushy retirements, our nice cars, our stable situations. And listen, many of those things are good things. They are things that we ought to be praying for. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we pray for the peace of the people among whom we live so that the church might flourish. The church might have stability and actually engage in doing the work of the gospel. But guys, when push comes to shove, are we ready to make any kind of sacrifices to make a stand for the sake of Christ? Like many, many Christians in our nation can't even shut the TV off. Makes you, what makes us think that we're going to be ready to stand when we're being beaten just for the sake of uttering the name of Jesus? Uh, you know, the world, the, world, the world not only is unable to hear the gospel, they don't want to hear the gospel, and they are going to force us into silence somehow. And right now, what are they using to silence us? Our love for the things that the world can offer. That's what they're using to silence us. I've said this before. I'll probably say it before I die again. I'll say it again before I die. Um, the only power that the world has over you is the power you give it. The power that the world has over you is, it's, is, is the power of your desire for the things of the world. We love our lives too much. That's the problem. I know that's hard. I know it's difficult, but it's true. You know, if we're going to be faithful followers of the Lamb, we, as we're going about seeking to be faithful followers of the Lamb, I know that I'm just like you. We can get scared as we are confronted with this machine, this juggernaut of the world coming against us and, and the devil driving the wheel. You know, we, can, 
We can be intimidated by the fact that the majority of people not only don't want to hear us or won't hear us, but they don't, they don't want to hear us. We can, we can be tempted to cower in the face of their hostility, letting their opposition make us feel insecure about our own walk with Christ. But we have to realize that as we go out into the world to be faithful servants of Jesus Christ, those people out there are not going to hear the gospel because they are unable to hear the gospel in and of themselves. you got to settle that. That's actually good news for us as we seek to go out and proclaim Christ. It's good news that they are not able in and of themselves to hear the truth. You want to know why? i got two reasons. Number one, because it means that when you share the gospel of Christ and they don't believe, it's not because you somehow failed. When you share the truth of Christ and and they don't want to hear it and they won't believe it and you're being true to the message of Scripture, but they just won't accept it. It's because they can't accept it and they don't want to accept it. But a second reason why that's good news, so so that gives us confidence as we keep sharing Christ. It doesn't matter how much the world rejects us. We continue to speak the truth with boldness and with love and with compassion, calling sinners to faith in Christ regardless of their opposition because that's our calling. We shouldn't be deterred in that by their unbelief. But then secondly, the fact that their own salvation, their ability to be saved is not in their own hands reminds us that their salvation is not impossible. See, if if it was in our hands, if their salvation was in our hands and we had to somehow figure out how to get them saved, boy, that's a scary thing. It's my responsibility to speak the word to them in such a way that I grab their hearts and get them into the kingdom before they slip out and back into the devil's hands. Boy, I'm glad that that responsibility is not on me. I'm not strong enough to do that. Have you ever tried reasoning with anyone out on the street for the sake of Christ? It is literally impossible, and you feel the impossibility of it when you're speaking the gospel to sinners in our day. It's not in our hands. It reminds, so it's not in our hands, and if, if power to, save, uh, to be saved was in their own hands, they for them to somehow figure out how to overcome their blindness and and their inability to hear the truth. They just need to rise above the fact that they are unable to hear the truth and somehow they need to figure out how to come out from underneath the power and the sway of the devil so that they can then be saved. If that's what it was up to, who's going to be saved? It is impossible then because we're willful servants of the enemy, aren't we? In ourselves, in our fallenness? Yes, we are. Now, what this reminds us is that power to be saved is in God's hands. Amen? Remember that word in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and following when it talks about homosexuals and drunkards and adulterers and all those, all those kinds of sinners who are characterized by those sins, they will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But, Paul says, such were some of you. You were like that. You were just like them. But you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. What brought you to faith? Was it your ability? Did you figure out? Did you figure out in your own strength the glory of Christ? And then tell him, inform him, you were willing to be his servant. You were happy to comply. He can now come down and do his thing in your life. Did you uncuff his hands and give him authority over your heart and mind? No, you did not. Gosh, if he had left you there, if he had left you to do that, you know where you'd be. He'd be right where I was, right where I would be. Lost and on my way to hell with no hope, impossible, of being saved. Such were some of us. Weren't we all dead in sin and children of wrath under the sway of the devil? Ephesians chapter 2. 
Were we all sinners in willful bondage to the lust of the devil? Didn't we all at one time suffer under blindness to the gospel of the glory of Christ? Wasn't there ever a time in your life when you did not see the glory of Christ? And didn't the power of God come to rescue us? <laughs> That's why salvation's not impossible when we remember that man in himself is unable to save himself. So, beloved, we can't lose heart in the face of those who stand against Christ. We can't embrace the cowardice of silence when we are in the presence of those who cannot and will not hear the truth of Christ's words. They are unable to hear them, but God can save even those who are unable to save themselves. In fact, God only saves those who are unable to save themselves. So what do we do? As we seek to be faithful servants of Christ, well, we do what Christ did. We understand their situation, we understand their condition, and we keep speaking the truth to them, even when they cannot and are unable to hear it. So why were they not believing in Jesus? Well, first reason is because they were not able to hear the word that Jesus was saying. But then notice the reason that Jesus gives for why they were not able. So they're not hearing the truth, they're not understanding, they're not grasping, they're not knowing the truth because they cannot hear it. They, cannot, they are unable to hear it. But why are they unable to hear it? Why don't they have the ability to hear it? Jesus answers that in verse 47. And in summary, it's because they are not, hear me now, it's because they are not the elect of God. Now, I want to show you that this is not me making something up and imposing it into the scripture text. This is what Jesus is teaching the Jews here in John chapter 8. The reason why they can't hear the word of God is because they are not of the elect of God. We'll talk about that. Verse 47, Jesus says, He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them, because you are not of God. What does that mean that someone is not of God? I think what's helpful is for us to start answering that question by answering, first of all, what does it mean to be of God, right? Because there are two categories of people here that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about those who are of God and those who are not of God. What does it mean to be of God? When we understand that, then we can understand what it means not to be of God. All right, so if you trace the use of this phrase, of God, it appears 27 times in the New Testament, this exact phrase that's used here in John 8, 47. If you trace that phrase, what you find is that to be of God is speaking about a special kind of relationship with God. So if a person is of God, that person has a special kind of relationship with God. And it's a relationship that begins with God. So for example, John 7, 17, when it comes to discerning uh, Jesus, the nature of Jesus' teaching, Jesus says, if anyone is willing to do his will, talking about the Father, he will know of the teaching whether it is of God. That is, whether this teaching comes from God, whether God is the source of this teaching, whether God is the originator of this teaching. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul describing the Holy Spirit there, he says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, the spirit that is derived from the world, the spirit that comes from the world. No, we haven't received the spirit that is of the world, but we have received the spirit who is from God. That is, the spirit comes to us as from God. God sends the spirit upon his people. Or Jesus himself, John 8, 42, I have proceeded forth and have come from God. What does that mean? That means that God is the source, God is the cause behind the arrival of Jesus the Messiah. God is the one from whom the Messiah originates. 
Okay? Now, putting these ideas together, for someone to be of God, that means that in some way that person derives from God or that person originates from God or that person finds his or her source in God. Okay? You with me on that? And sure, we can understand what that means for things like Jesus' teaching. We can understand what that means for the Holy Spirit to be from God. We can understand what that means for Jesus to be from God. But Jesus is here talking about a, a group of people very specifically, and he's identifying them as those who are of God. How do we understand this language being applied to a group of people? In fact, not only being applied to one group of people, but very specifically and intentionally not being applied to another group of people. Because there's one group of people who are of God, there's another group of people who are not of God. How do we understand that? What does that mean? Well, this is, I think it's, it's important for us to understand and to recognize that this language is one way that Jesus describes those who are often referred to as God's chosen people or God's elect people. I think John 6.37 and 6.39 maybe offers some clarity to this. Those who are of God are those who are given to the Son by the Father. That's what it means that they are from God. That's what it means that they are from the Father. It's that the Father has given them to his Son. John 6, 37, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, right? The one who comes to me, I will never cast out. So, so here's the deal. How do you know if, if someone has been given by the Father to the Son? We've gone through this before. They come to Jesus, right? If, if you are one who is coming to Jesus in sincere faith, then guess what? You have been given by the Father to his Son so that his Son would save you. Okay, now, the flip of that, what if someone doesn't come to the Son? What does that mean? The Father did not give that one to his Son. That's what that means. That's the clear teaching of this verse. All that the Father, all, everyone, whom the Father gives me will come. And the one who comes, I will not cast out. If you come to the Son, it's because you were given by the Father to the Son. That's what it means to be from God. It means that God gave you to the Son. Verse 39, and this, Jesus says, John 6, 39, and this is the will of him who sent me, that of all he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. Now look how secure the son keeps everything given to him by the father. None of it's lost. All of it gets raised up. All of it. The father's will for his son is to make sure that everyone that he gives to him that of all of those the Father gives to his Son, the Son loses none of them, but ensures that all of them get raised up on the last day. You, somebody should bless God right there because that's a good word. That means that your salvation is actually secure. That means that no matter what you're struggling with, where you've stumbled, how you're doubting right now, the discouragement and the despair that you fall into every day maybe, None of that is going to affect the end result of Christ being glorified and raising you up to eternal life for his sake. That's, that's why you are secure in Christ. Not because you are remaining faithful to him, but because he is eternally faithful to the will of his Father, which includes him saving you. Well, now, we step back and we think, well, wait a second, not everyone is going to be raised up on the last day, are they? There are some who are raised to a resurrection of life, and there are others who are resurrected into a resurrection of what? Death or a resurrection of judgment. 
Not everyone gets raised up to eternal life. So if Jesus is going to raise everything up on the last day, and the implication here is unto salvation, they're not lost. Everyone who's being raised up, they're being raised up because the Son is not losing them, right? So everyone who is raised up, they are those whom the Father has given to his Son. What about those whom the Son doesn't raise up? What about those What about those who are eternally lost? They perish forever in hell and they they endure the agony of eternal destruction away from the Lord and from the glory of his might. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. What about those? Were they given by the Father to the Son? Did the Father give the Son those people so that he would save them for eternity? No, otherwise the Son failed in his mission. That's blasphemous. We don't follow a Savior who can do anything. We don't follow a Savior who can be trusted with our eternal salvation because, hey, he lost those people. They were given to the Son just like I was given to the Son so that the Son might save them just like he's saved me. What what guarantees that I'm going to be saved if he lost them? You see the same idea in John chapter 17, verse 2. The Father gave his son authority over all flesh so that all whom the father have, has given the son, to all of them the son would give them eternal life. So there's authority of the son that encompasses everyone. All humanity for all human history, they are all subjugated to the authority of Jesus Christ as king. That includes Governor Walls, that includes Kamala Harris, that includes Donald Trump, that includes any and everyone else that you want to put into that blank. That includes every single one of you in this room. The Father has subjugated you to the authority of the Son. But the purpose for doing that is so that his Son would give eternal life to everyone that the Father gave to him. See, there's a difference between being submitted to the Son by the Father's decree, submitted to the Son's rule, and being given to the Son that you might have eternal life. All people are placed under the Son's authority, but not all people are going to be given the gift of eternal life. Jesus says only those who are given to him by the Father receive that gift, right? Right? All whom you have given me, all of you have given him, he may give eternal life. Well, not everyone gets eternal life. What's the implication? Not everyone is given. So that's, that is what Jesus is talking about here in John 8, 47. When Jesus speaks of one group of people as being of God, he is referring to those who have been given to him by his father so that he would save them. And when he is speaking about this other group of people who are not of God, he is talking about everyone else. Now, how are these two groups of people distinguished from each other? What distinguishes them from each other? Well, Jesus says the difference between them is seen by the way they respond to the message of God's word. John 8, 47, what does he say? He who is of God, what what are those who are of God? What do they do? What marks them? What distinguishes them? They who are of God, they hear the word of God. They hear it. Not just hear the physical words, but they actually hear it with saving enlightenment. Remember remember Jesus says, you're trying to kill me because my word finds no place in you. That's what it means not to hear the word. It means that it finds no place in you. It makes no inroads into your heart. It does not abide in you with staying power. It doesn't become the rule that governs all of your life. But if you hear the word, then that word has penetrated your soul. It has marked you off as being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It has gripped you in such a way that you must live the rest of your life in submission to the word of Jesus. John 8, 47, he who is of God hears the words of God. Those are the ones who are among God's elect people. 
those who hear the word of God. <laughs> and if a person is, is not of God, what does that mean? How do we know? What distinguishes them? Well, they don't hear the word of God. That signals that they are not of God. Now, I know that this is a very high, this is a very hard, very weighty teaching that Jesus is giving here. It's, it's, it's hard. It is hard to think about the fact that there are some sinners who have not been given by the Father to the Son, and they will perish eternally because that is what they deserve for their sin. You know, and, and, but let's keep in mind, isn't that what every single one of us deserves? God didn't have to save anyone. He could have wiped out the whole planet and existed for all the rest of eternity in perfect, unbroken, unhindered fellowship with his son and with the Holy Spirit. He does not need us. And it would not affect him if he handed us over to receive the full wages of what we deserve, every single one of us. But he chose to glorify his name by bringing out from that fallen mass of humanity, that hell-bound mass of humanity, God chose to glorify his name by picking people out and redeeming them for his sake to show the glory of his grace through them so that now the perfect justice of God will be put on display when he punishes sinners for their crimes against his throne and yet at the same time the perfect grace of God will be put on display in the lamb of God who is seated on the throne This is, this is the gospel. This is what God, this is what everything is all about. This is what your life is all about, whether you accept it or not. It's how they respond to the word. That's what distinguishes these two groups. How do you respond to the word? Now, we're, we're, we're coming right at the end now. Okay, I chose to split this sermon in two so that we did not have a repeat of last week. All right? Hour and 16 minutes, that's, that's pushing it. Even for you guys, all right? Some of you I know, but I appreciate it, but still. I want to close, though, by pointing out a, just, just a really significant element of application that's revealed to us right here in John 8:47. Once again, I want you to notice how objective Jesus is treating this topic, how objectively he is treating it. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, here's what I mean. There is no more important question in the world for every single one of you in this room to settle than the question, am I among the elect of God? This is why 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, commands each of us, right, to be diligent, to make certain about his calling and his choosing of us, right? Now, those aren't my words, okay? Those are the Holy Spirit's words given through the apostle Peter, contained for us in the New Testament. I didn't add those to the screen, you are called, all of us are called to, to make sure, make certain, to be diligent to make certain that God has truly called and chosen us. This is a vital matter. But here's what's important to remember. If you can just hang with me here for just a couple more minutes. Here's what is important. God commands us to make our calling and election sure, and yet he doesn't leave us playing the guessing game when it comes to trying to discern the truth. He doesn't say, hey, go find out if you're elect. <laughs> Good luck. I hope you figure it out. That's not what he does. 
The doctrine of election is revealed so that those who are proud in themselves would be brought low. That's why God revealed the doctrine of election. At least that's one prong in that purpose of revealing the doctrine of election. It's so that men who are proud in their own selves and in their own abilities would be humbled before a sovereign God. But there's another purpose for the doctrine of election being revealed. And it is for the comfort of the church. The doctrine of election, beloved, is for your comfort. It's not to unsettle you. It's not to make you wonder and doubt and speculate about God's goodness towards you or whether or not you truly belong to him or whether his love is really poured out upon you. That's not the purpose. God wants his people to have assurance in their walk with him. He doesn't want us staggering around in doubt all the time. What kind of testimony is that to the power of his salvation? When we doubt his goodness all the time, what are we saying to the world when we say, "Uh, you need to repent and believe in Jesus, but I really don't know if I'm saved. You know, I don't want any of my children to have to second guess or doubt my love or my devotion to them. Can't look at them right now. I'm going to start crying. I love my children more than life, and I will lay my life down in a heartbeat for their well being. I never want them to feel insecure about their place in our family as my children. I will fight for them, I will protect them, I will kill anyone if it means keeping them safe. Now, I'm a wicked, evil man. If I feel that way about my children, how much more does God feel that way about his? If I can be filled with such zeal that they would know that they are loved and they are secure and they have, they have an absolute firm place fixed in our family that isn't going anywhere no matter what they do. If I'm filled with that kind of zeal, then how much more does God want his children to be filled with that kind of confidence? God wants us to know clearly whether we are among those who are of God or not. And he has given us a very simple, very objective test to discern the truth about ourselves. And it boils down simply to this. How do we respond to his word? That's it. How do you respond to the gospel? The message of Jesus Christ crucified for sinners, the resurrected Lord Jesus in power, the one who is worthy to be Savior, the one who can take the scroll out of the hand of the Father and bring all the purposes of God to pass for the rest of human history. What does your heart do whenever it hears a message like that? Does it resonate? Does it it come on you with saving power and drawing you after the Lord and saying, is God really that good? Is Jesus truly that loving? Does it draw you after him or do you hear it and you think, big deal. Read myths about Zeus and I watched the Marvel movies. There's nothing exciting about what the Bible says. How do you respond to the word of God. Romans 15, four to five, right? Do do we hear the voice of God speaking to us in the scriptures, right? Does God, does the God who gives perseverance and encouragement, because that's what God does. Verse five, he gives perseverance and he gives encouragement. Does he do that in our hearts through the scriptures? Because that's the means, verse 4 says, he uses to do that. The scriptures were given so that we would have perseverance, so that we would have encouragement, so that we would have hope. When you read the word of God, when you're in the scriptures, when you're meditating upon its truth, is there a hope that comes into your soul from God? Is there encouragement from the Holy Spirit? Is there conviction that draws you out of sin and and gives you confidence to run to Jesus as a perfect Savior? Does that happen in your heart? Or do you find yourself resisting it, ignoring it, bored by it, not really truly believing? That manifests a difference between those who are of God and those who are not. 
Now, we need to end today, but, but as we end, just listen to how Paul uses this truth to encourage the Thessalonian believers. Right, the believers in Thessal- Thessalonica at this time, they were suffering, they were oppressed believers. But look at how Paul seeks to encourage them in the faith. Verse 13 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. Let me just stop for a second. If the doctrine of being of election, of being chosen by God for salvation, was simply confusing and high-minded and had no rele- relevant purpose for the church, why would Paul be appealing? Why would he be appealing to it right here in order to comfort these suffering believers? He's doing this because there is hope and there is comfort to be found in the fact that we are chosen of God. There's staying power to that. There's enough comfort there to help us endure and persevere through whatever it is that we're experiencing. That no matter what, when I was at my worst, God chose to save me. Will he not still have those same desires to save me now? No matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm suffering, no matter what I've done, God, please forgive me for what I've done. The Lord says, I've chosen you. I love you. Turn from your sin and believe in me. God has chosen you from the beginning. Paul wants the believers to be comforted by that. And how did he know that they were chosen by God for salvation from the beginning? Number one, by the sanctifying of the Holy Spirit. By their faith in the truth, they believed the truth of the gospel. And the Spirit worked in their lives with it with power. Verse 14, they were called through the gospel so that they would gain the glory of Christ. And then he says, so then, brethren... Stand firm. Stand firm. You're beloved. You're chosen. Look at what the gospel worked among you. Now stand firm in the Lord in the midst of your trials. Be faithful to God who has chosen to save you from the beginning. Oh, beloved, I hope that you too can be confident and be bold in the Lord and that you can stand firm in the Lord, that you will have courage and that you will have conviction of knowing that God has chosen you for salvation from the beginning because the word of God and the impact of the word of God on your life proves it. I pray that that will give you comfort and assurance. If you have questions, please come talk with me at the end of this. As I finish, uh, we finish our closing hymn, I'll stay up here and I'll talk with you. I'll counsel with you. If you need help understanding this more, please just come talk to me. Don't hold it in. Don't be to yourself. The Lord calls you to come, so, be, so come. Well, this is Jesus' assessment of their condition. They could not hear the words of God because they were not of God. And we'll come back next week to look at how Jesus responds to them in verses 48 to 51. So, Father, I thank you for the truth, this comforting truth that you have given a people to your son so that he would save them. I thank you, Lord, that you have appointed your word to be the means by which they are called out of their sin and called out of the world and gathered into the fold of the Messiah. Lord, help us as we pay attention to your word, as we read and meditate and memorize, as we proclaim your word. Help us be confident in ourselves that you have truly worked salvation within us. And if we are not confident of that, then Lord, help us heed your command in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, that we would come to you. Or do you have the answer for us if we're struggling? And so I pray that we would not lose heart or lose hope, but that we would come to you as a perfect Savior at all times. Lord, bless us as we sing this closing hymn. May our, may our hearts truly be filled with a sense of awe and wonder and the fear of the Lord. And may our lips sing genuine praises to your name. We pray this, Father, in Jesus Christ. We ask this for his sake. Amen.